the ceremony. <laughs> uh, good to see you all and good to be back with you. And uh, we've had a good couple of weeks while well, we were away ourselves. And uh, all is good and blessed in our lives. Good to be here. And uh, there's a service we clocked in this morning as well at 12.15. And uh, the service tonight is uh, in Kailaki. And that will probably be the last service where Gordon Matheson is preaching in the area for a while, I guess, because he uh, is moving very shortly. So hopefully we can make it out to these services. Anyway, we are here to, to worship God, and uh, we're going to begin by singing from Psalm 103, <coughs> and the beautiful words of the psalm, the psalm which uh, just gives ourselves a good talking to, and uh, says to our souls, praise God, and tells our souls what God has done for us, his forgiveness and his rescue. So let's stand and let's worship God together. <laughs> Well, 
Say whenever he calls you up.
So she called me that, and he called me that, and they all called me that, and I feel horrible. And because if you feel like that today, you'll still feel a bit like that tomorrow. And if it happens tomorrow, you'll feel even worse. And if it keeps happening, you'll grow up feeling bad about yourself. So don't, don't, don't listen and don't do it because here's something that God says to us. He says, don't be afraid. Fear not. You will no longer live in shame. You're no longer going to feel bad about yourself. You're no longer going to feel rubbish because of all the names you be called. There is no more disgrace for you. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth. Like when you're young, sometimes that's when shame begins. It did with me. When you're young, often that's when you start to feel bad about yourself. When you're young, God says, I'm not like that. I'm not going to make you feel ashamed. I'm not going to make you feel bad about yourself. So we come to church for something different on Sunday. Not all the bad words we keep hearing on television or we keep hearing in the play player, but we come together to hear about God with everlasting love. I have compassion on you. That's something better. That's something good that everyone here, old and young, needs to hear from our Lord and our God. And so we pray to Him and we listen to His word. And we let him take all the bad words that have been said to us out of us, all the ugly stuff, all the horrible stuff that has been said to us, and take these bad little words from our lips as well. And we come to God today to put good words in our lives. Words of beauty, words of kindness, words of love and compassion. Because that's what we really need in our lives. Yeah? So let's pray. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for that simple, simple message. We ask you to forgive us this morning for all the times that we have used words that have hurt others, words that put others down, made them feel bad and disgusting and ugly and dirty and ashamed. And uh, we ask as well, Lord, that you will take away those words from our lives and we'll never call ourselves these things and we'll never let other people call us these things and accept what they say and listen to what they say help us Lord Jesus help us to listen to your compassion and your love and to forget our shame and not to be afraid and not to be disgraced because you have come for us to be our Lord and our Saviour, to die on the cross, to take away the bad things, and to make us good and new. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Right, well, we're going to sing now, just a little, little chorus, <coughs> John's going to lead us. So, let's stand. Let's all stand up, and, uh, and let's sing together.
to read together from Isaiah. Remember, uh, just a two weeks old, days, so three weeks ago, uh, I began to look at the subject of shame uh, and to look at the chapter in Isaiah, chapter 54, that really deals with that theme. Uh, after, of course, about several weeks of studying through Isaiah, uh, Isaiah in 10 weeks or so, uh, but we're going to focus in really on a theme in Isaiah, and it's a theme of shame. Uh, and we've already begun to look at that in Isaiah 54 and verses 1 to 3. We thought about the shame of barrenness, the shame uh, where we should have life, but there's no life. And we feel ashamed because where life should be, it isn't there. Today we're going to think about the shame of rejection. Shame of rejection. So we're going to read in a minute. Let me just give the, the notes before we read together. And there's a few things just to think about. Um, notes from Johanna, the annual blast with shoebox appeal is underway. And if you'd like to support that, one of the one of the places you can get hold of shoeboxes and the stuff to put in them. Uh, which make gifts to people in different parts of the world who don't have as much as we have. Uh, this is in the cafe on Friday. So if you're at, if you're at the cafe on Friday, each Friday you open for cafe, then you can go to the back room and there's already wrapped, Christmas wrapped, shoe boxes and lots of stuff to buy put in them. And mm -hmm. Johanna and her team will take it from there. So that's uh, over the over cafe, which is on Fridays from half ten to two, and everyone in the community is welcome to come along to that. Bring a friend as well. And um, reminder that this is September, and that the collection at the end of the service, the town collection, goes for the work of the local youth charity. Cool. And that reminds us that uh, Timmy and the team are away this weekend with nineteen young people, nineteen teenagers from the area. Uh, at the Elton Creek Outdoor Centre in Abingmore. Uh, so do pray for that. Uh, it's so important, such an important time uh, in the lives of these young people. It's a highlight of the year for many of them. And uh, just pray for everything to go well and for Jesus to speak into their hearts. Uh, so, um, prayer meeting Wednesday, the Greek Fellowship, we have started to look at a few current kind of issues last week, we're looking at drugs last week, thinking about that, I don't say we're using drugs, I say we're looking at drugs as a theme, thinking about what the Bible has to take, say about it, and uh, um, how we can approach compassionately the whole subject. Um, next Sunday the services are at the usual times, 10.30 and 5.30 here. Now, we always have a communion weekend in September, and that's uh, next Sunday. And my colleague, the Reverend John Ross, um, Terror Minister of uh, Drummondrocket, for Augustus, he is going to come, and uh, with his wife Elizabeth, and John is going to take the services next Sunday. So it's communion, and uh, we look forward to sharing the Lord's Supper at the close of the service. But do come along just for the, the fellowship and the, the worship and the teaching as well. And, uh, Look forward to having John with us actually very much. Um, if you're thinking about membership in the congregation or something that you haven't done before, then uh, the elders are very glad to encourage you in that step. <coughs> uh, and uh, just a couple of things to look a bit further ahead to. <coughs> if I go back very, very quickly here, I'm going to do this on some of switch on. There we go. Go right back to the beginning here. This this uh, this is a week Wednesday. <coughs> so this is an event that's happening throughout the Free Church in Scotland. Uh, healthy church gatherings, and uh, this, these are very important because they're about really they're about the future of church in each community. And uh, we're hosting a gathering for Macar and Albacross, Glenelg, Greenhead, and Stath and Slate, as well as here a week Wednesday. Uh, and uh, 
will have folk from the, the Central Church and then we're coming on to speak about uh, how we as a church and the local churches can be refreshed and revitalized in our sharing of Jesus with our community. So if you can, uh, come along to that. That's a week and Wednesday. And then the night before is unfortunately two things happen the same week, but the night before it's going to be our incredible privilege to host Adam. Now, if you read the, the monthly record magazine, uh, which you get each, each month, uh, you'll see every month there's Adam's diary. And Adam, it's not his proper name, it's not his real name, uh, he works in Central Asia in uh, a Muslim country where there's great, great danger, uh, great persecution, but where the church is really starting to flourish. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to hear some of I mean, uh, the stories in the record are just amazing, they're great. But we're going to hear some of, some first hand stuff from Adam and so we can choose to. So keep these two things in mind as well. Okay, fly forward again. Here we go. To Isaiah. Right. So we're going to read Isaiah and, uh, from chapter 54, verses 1 to 10. This is what we're going to read this morning. Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who are never in labour, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not go by, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left, your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. <clears throat> Do not be afraid, you will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace, you will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with deep compassion. I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. To me, this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Beautiful words. May God add his blessing to your reading of <coughs> his word. So we're going to join together now in prayer. Set our hearts before God. Please help us, Lord, to uh, enter your gates with praise, approach your courts with joy. Help us, Lord, because uh, in our own spirits we have all kinds of things happening, fooling us, distracting us and diverting us and burdening us. And we come to you this morning, living God, and we pray that you will help us to get a glimpse of something different, something beautiful, something higher and better, to get a, a revelation for <coughs> you a revelation by your Holy Spirit 
through your word as we study it this morning. We pray, Lord, that we'll break into the ordinariness and into the normality of our lives. We'll break into the way that we are used to being a certain way in our lives. And Lord, that you will help us to look for different, for better, through Jesus Christ. Father, we know that we read in your word sometimes truly wonderful and amazing things, and great encounters with you, uh, remarkable events. And we also hear about those events, Lord, happening uh, in our world today, sometimes in our own community and sometimes elsewhere. We thank you, Lord, for those who come from time to time to visit to tell us about other parts of the world and the amazing things that you're doing in different places. And Heavenly Father, we ourselves also probably have stories of encounters with you in our own lives. And Heavenly Father, we want to come this morning uh, looking to you, hungry and thirsting for righteousness, seeking you that we may find you, Lord, that we may have fresh encounters with you through Jesus Christ, that, Lord, we may come into his presence again this morning, and that, Lord, we may hear the words that flow from his heart, from his lips. We may hear uh, the good news of grace, this gospel of salvation, and we may get hope. And we may get uh, uh, a renewed sense of uh, the power of the gospel, the opportunity it gives, the forgiveness it offers, and the release from bondage that it brings, freedom and <coughs> intimacy with you. So Lord, come to us, we pray. And we pray this, Lord, for all the fellowships of your people around the area today. And we ask Heavenly Father, uh, because we know that for many there is discouragement at this time. We ask, Father, for uh, a real uh, coming in, a, in surprising ways in the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And that people's doubt, uh, people's unbelief, people's fear will be turned into faith and hope and expectation and excitement and renewal. Heavenly Father, we want to see great things. We want to see Lazarus' graves. We want to see people whose lives are regarded by others as hopelessly a mesh in sin, being turned around and becoming uh, beacons of the power of the gospel in our community, uh, being truly uh, brought to new life through Jesus Christ, so that no one can deny the power of your gospel or explain it away. Heavenly Father, we look to you today. We pray, Father, for uh, your grace with the young people who are at uh, this weekend. Your anointing with Timmy and with all of the team who are uh, taking care of the young people and speaking and sharing the good news with them. We pray for truly exceptional things to take place there and for, uh, Lord, you to reveal yourself in very powerful ways. And the Lord, so many of our, our young people are you know, just you know, often the brunt of all that's wrong in our society. And they suffer because the parents you know, are doing wrong. The fathers are eating sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll have mercy upon our world, Father, upon our young people. And uh, we pray, Father, for your blessing as well with Ku and with uh, the uh, plans to have a, an extra worker, a part-time worker, to assist in me and to take on some of the administrative side of things. Please pour your grace upon uh, the provision of that and uh, guide us as we seek to make that happen. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you will uh, just remember, we thank you for the Nakahashis, whose prayer letter we sent out this week. We thank you for Osamu and for Mari and their family. And we thank you, Lord, for the provision of a building in uh, Tagajo, uh, 
entire Joe community and uh, church that we call it. And even though it's a tiny congregation, Father, and perhaps especially because of this, we pray, Lord, that you will, you will show your grace. And Lord, that uh, they will, as we just read, have to enlarge the place of their tent and extend their, their tent pegs and get take bigger space because Heavenly Father of what you're doing through the gospel in their midst. Bless them, Father. And we do pray. We pray in our own church, Lord, for we just think of a few days ago how three different ministers were inducted to charges. We pray for Matty Guy in Dingle, and for James Murray in Campbelltown, for Don Smith, the assistant minister in Aberdeen. We pray for your anointing upon uh, these men and their wives and their families and as they settle in and as they uh, begin to engage with the congregation and the communities in which they're placed. Please richly bless their service to you, to your glory. Heavenly Father, we, we worship you. We pray, Father, now that you will guide us forward for the rest of this time. You bless and be with the young people in the uh, Sunday school this morning. Pray, Heavenly Father, that your name will be exalted and glorified in our lives. Hear our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay. I'm going to sing now from Psalm 71 and Isaiah 54. So Psalm 71, and I'm going to sing the words of the psalm where God said in the psalm to bring us back just like we read in Isaiah 54 to bring us up to life once more as it says in verse 20 there and uh, the shame falls not on us but on our enemies as the psalm says so let's sing these verses up and speak now to God's peace
as the psalm is saying when you're feeling down. Yes, a lot there to lift you up. Let's return to Isaiah and uh, chapter 54. And think about the shame of rejection. Now, you might be wondering why we're studying shame. You might be thinking to yourself, what really has that got to do with me? Because I think some people know all about shame, but there are other people who don't even really see it or see, see it themselves, certainly. And sometimes it's good to just listen to the perspective of people outside of the Bible and outside of the Christian church. And uh, today, as, as always, it's often our, our novelists, our poets, our playwrights that are often very good at understanding and looking into what uh, is truly going on in the human race and trying to explore it. Uh, and often that's what dramas are all about. Uh, they're trying to explore their soap operas, explore what's happening in the world and the emotions and the experiences of people. George Bernard Shaw, a very well-known playwright, he said this, we live in an atmosphere of shame. We're ashamed of everything that is real about ourselves. We're ashamed of ourselves, of our relatives, of our incomes, of our accents, of our opinion, of our experience, just as we are ashamed of our own naked bodies. That was George Bernard Shaw. I mean, he wrote that a long time ago. It's true today. It's probably more true today. We live in a world of shame. And shame is so corrosive. It's so destructive of individuals and of society. So we're going to take a quick trip through verses 3 to 10. We're going to come back to it again. Uh, when I'm back here preaching, I think in a few weeks' time. Sorry, I've been away quite a bit the last few weeks, the next couple. Uh, it's just so hard. So once I come back, you'll have me probably at Christmas. <laughs> um, the shame of rejection. So, <clears throat> verses 4 to 6. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear this place. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth. And remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. Now you see verse 6 there. Can you feel the shame of that woman? Can you feel it? Entering into marriage. And in those days, marriage was status. You had a husband. You had a family. You had an inheritance. And all the expectation of a life with that status and a life with family, a life with uh, grandchildren, maybe a life of fulfillment. It's taken away because the man <coughs> writes a certificate of divorce for whatever reason and sends his wife, his young wife, Away. She's got no status. She's distressed in spirit. She's distressed in spirit. Rejected. You feel that. And it's not just something you get over in a day. It's something that's going to go with that woman for the rest of her days. And that's something truly remarkable happens. She's going to have, to use the words of verse 4, shame, disgrace, and humiliation. Now we've all experienced that because whether it's looking to a husband or to a wife to give us space, uh, 
we all look to individuals, and some people are very important in our lives as we're growing up. We look to our parents, obviously, grandparents, people we trust in the family. We look to our teachers. We look to maybe the coach of our team. We look to our friends. And if we meet important people in our lives, they're important, we look to them to give us status. And as we grow up, we look to our partners in life, our employer. And of course, in a sense, we can look to ourselves to achieve things, to give us status so that we can hold our head up and not feel <coughs> And ultimately, everyone, whether they know it or not, looks to God. Now, if any of those status givers rejects us, we'll shame. You may be here this morning, you're in church, or you may be even sitting here today feeling shame, feeling rejection. Maybe you don't. I mean, there's someone probably going to be out of church this morning saying, I don't know what Robbie's talking about this morning. Everyone thinks I'm amazing. Because <laughs> some people are like that. Some people are just without shame. Um, and just think, seem to think everyone thinks are marvelous. But you may not be that person. And you may know at least something of what shame really is. <coughs> Sometimes we see it when we meet new people. Because we build up shame accounts with people we know. So when we meet someone new, there's no shame in the account. And so we meet them, and it's full of hope. Every new friend that we make, every new meeting, is full of hope. And there's no shame there. And we get to develop the relationship. And then at some point, something awkward happens in the relationship. Or we say the wrong thing, or they say something to us and we interpret in a certain way. And we begin to feel the shame that we feel in all our other relationships. And that shame, eh, when it comes into a relationship, starts to break it down. It starts to eat away at it. And uh, it feels like rejection. And we feel to ourselves things like, oh, there we go again, I've just blown it again. Maybe you know that. And the more important the person is that we're trying to get alongside or trying to be friend, the more the lift we feel when we get to know them, and the more the drop that we feel when shame comes in. Shame's everywhere. <coughs> and rejection is everywhere. So what we want to do is try and get out of that, get hope for ourselves. Not only that, we, if you listen carefully today uh, to what God says in his word, take it out with you tomorrow. Give someone else some hope. Give someone else the possibility to be released from their shame. So, let's think about what Isaiah says. He speaks about shame, he speaks about salvation from shame. And uh, that's, that's the first what, what does he say? Let's just go through quickly the, the verses that we've got before us. So, in verse 4 it says, You will forget the shame of your youth. It's a very precious passage. Now, now what happened in the youth of the people Isaiah is writing to? Remember from our studies of Isaiah, these are people who have been oppressed horribly and humiliated by the Assyrians. And they are going to be not only oppressed horribly and humiliated by the Babylonians, but they're going to be taken out of their country, and it's going to be a sign of rejection by God, and they're going to be exiled to Babel. They're going to be deported, and they become strangers in a strange land. So in their youth, there's going to be a lot of shame. And we can see the words that are used there, disgrace, and humiliation, and so on, distress, they're all there. So, going forward to the next two verses, who was it who rejected Judah? Who was it who rejected the people that Isaiah ministers among? And the answer is God himself. I abandoned you for a brief moment, God says in verse 8, in the surge of anger. I hid my face from you for a moment. And 
you think, well, isn't that the opposite of what Christianity is about? Isn't, isn't God about receiving people? Well, yes, but these people had first of all rejected God. So you go back a few chapters to chapter 50. This is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's addressing God's people of Judah? This is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away. Where is it? Sorry. Or to which my creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins you were sold. Because of your transgressions, your mother was sent away. So God had rejected his own people. Now it wasn't without cause because of their idolatry. We looked into all their violence and uh, their faithlessness to him. God had exiled them to Babylon. So sometimes in our lives we will go through periods, even as Christians, if we reject God in our lives, we will experience exile from his presence. Have you known that as a Christian? No times do you know what you did. <coughs> but God is not wanting you to stay in that exile. Because he's not wanting you to stay in the sin that caused the exile. God always, always, always wants to bring us to himself. But sometimes he just can't hold us close because of the way we're living. And we were thinking. Now, some days people don't care about that. They don't care that they're far from God. But what this chapter is telling us is God does not want us to stay far away if we seek Him, if we seek His comfort, if we seek to get out of the shame that we've got ourselves into, then we can find Him. So, verse 7, and so I go back to verse 7 there. Let me see. God says, I abandon you, but with deep compassion, I will bring you back. You know, I hid my face from you, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you. And they will have a renewed status. Verse 5, your maker is your husband. We've got a husband again. And the Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. God saved us. God's taken us out of the shape. We've got to save us again because he's in our lives. That is the good news of this. So, just going forward again, do you want to escape shame in your life? If you can identify it this morning, do you want to escape shame? Do you want the Lord to take away your shame? Well, let's go back to verses 4 to 6 again because he can. See, if you reject God, if anyone rejects God, you know, no one can help you with your shame. Because our shame is shame before God. We do whatever we like in life. We can take the pills, we can go to the guru, we can try the self-help, but the shame doesn't go away. Nothing can shift shame from our lives if it's shame before God, except God himself. If it's shame because of our sin, then it's shame because he is rejecting us because of our sin. Nothing, nothing at all can remove that, sh that shame except God himself. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you achieve in life. We're all trying to achieve things in our lives. And whether we know it or not, part of the motivation that probably everyone has for achievement it's to get rid of shame. It's trying to feel better about ourselves. Trying to make other people talk better about us. And to try even to feel better before God. But we can't get rid of shame ourselves. We can't change what's happened. We can't change the past. We can't change people. But if, as verse 5 says, God is our husband and our redeemer, then the shame's gone. You'll forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the approach of the Lord. <coughs> this is his, his promise to us. 
There's these verses at the end there, right? verse 9 and 10, of the passage you read. And God is saying, when I promise to take away your shame, you know, if you come to me with your shame, if you come to me seeking to have your shame taken away, I, and I promise to take it away, I promise to make you not to forget completely the shame of your youth and of your widowhood. Your if I promise to do that, then it's just like the promise I made to Noah. It's just like the, it's just like the the mountain that so won't be shame. It's a covenant of peace. It's something I will do, says the Lord, who has compassion on us. And God is here in this chapter committing himself to remove your shame. If you come to him. That's what it is. So, let's, uh, let's take a bit of fun. How do, how do we get rid of shame? The shame of rejection especially. General shame. How do we get rid of it? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to identify our shame. <coughs> now, when you think of times of rejection in your own life, you'll feel ashamed still. So, can you think of those times of rejection and recognize the harm that shame does because it takes you down? diminishes your spirit. You think about those times you have been rejected. And let's think about a situation, a real situation. Let's think about a little boy and his relationship with his dad. But his dad keeps rejecting him because his dad would rather spend his days in the pub than with his son. And the son begins to feel that rejection of what's wrong with me that my dad would rather be in the pub. And as he grows a little, he begins to reject his dad. And one day he tells him that he hates his dad. So the little boy has shame, and the dad has shame as well. And the next day the boy comes home and he finds that his dad has packed his cases and left. And maybe in a sense he feels relief from the devastation of his father's alcoholism. But there's something else. His dad has not even said goodbye. His dad has just walked away. He is completely rejected by his father. And his mother is completely rejected as well because he's done the same to her. So she has shame as a rejected wife, something along the lines of what Isaiah is describing here. And the boy has shame as a rejected son. And he also has shame because he's the son of a rejected mother, a rejected wife. And ten years later, when the boy finally catches up with his father, and now the boy is a man, the father says things to him that repeat the rejection and intensify it. And so whenever there's any rejection in that boy who's become a man's life, he's got all that shame baggage, massive shame baggage to deal with. Because shame is part of the furniture of his life. I'm not making this up. Those of you who know me, know I'm describing myself. But what I've found is it's very hard to see shame. Because it's part of the furniture. It's very hard to see things that we, we live with constantly. I don't have another Roddy, a, a Roddy without shame to compare myself with. I mean, the Roddy without shame would be jumping around in joy, probably. I don't know what the Roddy without shame would look like, but it would be very different to the Roddy who's been given all that baggage of shame. I, don't, I can't see what that is like, it's because there isn't someone like that. 
but it's me without shame. So I, I live with the, the familiar of what I have, and it's hard to see it because when it's there a long time, you just can't see it anymore. But it's there, you don't even know the name of shame in your life. And shame is there all the time, it's so easy to come back to, it's so easy to, to uh, come back to when you've done anything wrong, when you've sinned, when you've just been stupid, or you've made a mistake, messed up in some way. Uh, it's so easy just to take shame from these things. And also, having shame makes it easier to mess up and sin. And when you get into situations where there are stateless people around you, you feel like an imposter because these people, um, you know, why, why do they want me around? You know, you shouldn't be treating me this well because I have shame. It's all there in the lives of all of us to some extent, maybe to a great extent. It's there. But you cannot say to God, you shouldn't be treating me this way. Can you? You can't say that to God. Because God decides to treat us well, well that's, that's God's business. If God decides to treat us well, we should be very, very, very glad about that. And that's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is about setting us free from Shame. So, we have to identify the shame, but then we have to believe the promise. The promise that takes it away. So, we go back to verses 4 to 6. Can we really believe that verse 4 can happen? Can we really believe that we will not be humiliated anymore, that we will not be disgraced? Can we really believe that the shame of our youth will be forgotten? The reproach of our widow, the reproach of rejection, that God will call us back, as verse 6 says. Call us back and bring us to himself and, and keep that promise like Noah, that promise like the mountains that will not be shaken. You understand what believing means, don't you? Believing means that what you believe, you act on. It changes you. It motivates you to do things. So what does motivate, what does believing the promise here of forgetting the shame of our youth, what does it motivate us to do? Well, in, in Christian terms, it has to motivate us to pray. It has to. That's what we must do in response to the promise of God about our shame. Pray. Now, these are words in Isaiah 54. God abandoned us. Uh, he he hid his face from us without adjusting it, with good cause. He did that. And so in prayer, we do need to tell God, Lord, I know that you abandoned me just. I know uh, that uh, if I was without your presence in my life, it's because of the way I was living. It's not because of anything you knew God. We need to tell God that. And uh, we also need to tell him, um, something about how we respond to the rejections in life. I don't think we should dwell on these things. I don't think you go and tell God a big soft story and make it, spring <coughs> it out, because if you do that, it will make it feel worse. But you need to pray. You need to make contact with God. And you need to recognize that shame is going to make that difficult. Shame makes, really, makes prayer really difficult. Because when we come to God, we just feel what am I doing here? Why would I be in the presence of God? I who have been rejected. I who have carried so much shame. I have grown uh, so worthless. My name is worthless. You'll see that in the hymn that we're going to close with. A worthless name. Why would God want anything to do with me? That's what happens when we try to pray. And we need to we need to just put that aside. We, we've got to keep praying. We've got to keep going. Because we know that the promise is God's going to take that shape away. Yeah, and He's given us and He's promising us a destiny without shame.
So we need to we need to pray. And it's not just going to be a little prayer. It's probably something we have to make a business of praying about in our lives. Maybe pray a lot about. Maybe at a particular time really focus on. Uh, and maybe other just generally keep going. If you've been someone that's carried the shame of rejection and other kinds of shame, the shame of barrenness, shame of sin, you need to really do business with God and His promises to uh, to keep counteracting the corrosive influence of sin in your life so that you may be free. So that you may be free. And uh, let's come back then to verses 4 to 6. So that, so that we may know the outward of what verse 5 says. We've come to God. He's promised us salvation. He's promised us to take away our guilt and our shame and to be our husband, your maker as your husband. And be married, to use the picture, Isaiah is using a picture of Judah and God's people, be married to God. Probably a, a more um, powerful picture is the picture of being child of God and God being our father but both of these are, are, are wonderful, wonderful pictures God being our redeemer is there as well and God has that, that kindness that everlasting compassion that he speaks about with us to cast and take away our sin now we'll come back to this and think about the cross and shame next time, hopefully because that's where it all is properly dealt with. But Isaiah's not really thinking about that. He does in the previous chapter, of course, chapter 53, he speaks about, about the servant, Jesus, who's going to be bruised and crushed and wounded for our transgressions. But this is a passage to God's people before Jesus came as well. And it's just saying, you have been rejected. You have been shamed deeply by your behaviour and by, by Assyria and by Babylon and by all that you've been through as a people. But I am bringing you back, God says, and I am your maker, your husband, your redeemer, your father. So do not ever, ever let shame estrange you from me again. Do not ever carry shame again. That's what God is saying to you and me because of the gospel, because of Jesus, because of his relationship, his covenant, his commitment, his promise. He's saying, bring it to me in prayer, receive what is promised, and don't go back to the shame. Just close with the words of Hebrews 11, which I think speak about this. So again, Hebrews 11 is speaking about God's people, it's speaking about special uh, people that stand out in the Old Testament, people of faith. And it's saying if they had been thinking of a country, country they, they, they'd left, so think of the Jews, they've come back from Babylon to, to Jerusalem and Judah again, they could have returned. They would have had an opportunity to return. So, you know, the people Isaiah is ministering to here, when they come back, from Babylon, and the shame of that place, back to their inheritance, back to status with God again, back to where God is, is dwelling in their midst in his holy temple again, and they come back to that renewed status. Yeah, they could go back to Babylon, but they don't want to. They could go back to shame. They could return to a life without God, but instead they're longing for even better, because the destiny that we have in Jesus Christ the destiny that we have in the living God is a destiny from, of a better country, a heavenly one, where there isn't any shame anymore. But listen to this. Therefore, people who believe the promise of God, people who are people of faith and who trust that God will have them forget the shame of their youth and the reproach of their widowhood and all that rejection and all that hurt 
and all that burden. People who believe God, God is not therefore ashamed to be called their God. He's not ashamed. It's not amazing. I mean, I think I can think of a thousand reasons why God would be ashamed of you. Maybe you can too, or you should be able to. You know yourself. But God, through the gospel, is not ashamed to be called our God. He's not ashamed of us. Now, I'm talking about imposter syndrome. You know, how would you, how can you be in the presence of God? You call yourself a daughter of God, or son of God, child of God. How can you be in that place? Because of God's promise. Because you've trusted God to take away your shame. He's your redeemer. He's your maker. He's your husband. And he's your savior. And you've trusted him. And because he says when you trust him to take away your shame, he's taken away your shame. He's not ashamed of you. Now, if God's not ashamed of you, no one else can put shame on you. Now, if someone if you go outside and someone tries to put you down, it makes a, a, a snake common, treats you rudely, you're not going to carry the shame of that anymore because you can say to them, I know you're treating me badly, but actually, God isn't ashamed of you. So I'm not going to take the shame that you're trying to get me. That's when the gospel starts to really work in the realm of shame. You begin to see this. If God is not ashamed of me, I don't have shame anymore. That is the goal for us. That is the goal for us as Christians, in terms of shame and anyway. A life that is free of the shame of the past, and a life that will not take on any more shame in the present or in the future. Because God is not ashamed of us. He's our Father. A Father who, unlike my father, is not ashamed. So whatever shame my father put on me, it's not there. And I've got to stop thinking it is. It's not there. Because my father in heaven is not ashamed. Whatever shame you've ever had put on you, believe the promise. And God is your Father, your husband, your Redeemer. He's not ashamed of you. And no one can put shame on you. Only you can hold shame within yourself still. That isn't really there. Deceive yourself by thinking like the gospel isn't true. Don't do that. God is not ashamed of you. Do not be ashamed. Because if God is not ashamed, you don't have shame anymore. Hallelujah. Let's pray for a moment together. Lord, this is great to recite us a message even for myself at this moment. Just saying these things is precious and great, Lord. But let it be great for all of us, for all who maybe listen to this uh, uh, on, online at some point. Or Lord, let it be great for us taking this message to the people of our community as well. Lord, help us to believe the promise. Be set free from shame. And Lord, no longer to feel imposters in your presence. But Heavenly Father, to claim our inheritance and to dwell in your presence. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So there's a hymn, I've never sung this hymn before, I think, but uh, I was looking for hymn and shame. And uh, verse 2 Nor will he put my soul to shame. That's what uh, the hymn says. Just think about this, just four verses. 
think of it in the words of the sin. It's quite, quite powerful, actually. Written by Isaac Watts.